Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 23. If you don't, we'll have it on the screen for you as well. Not a problem. Not all scriptures that I have today will be on the screen, but our notes are online at calvarydover.org forward slash grow, where you can see scriptures and things that I used for our message. Today's sermon is called The Intersection of Life and Death. We come to the moment of the cross. We've been on the road to the cross, and we come to this moment where on the hill of Calvary or Golgotha, there is this crossroads, so to say, if you will, or, or intersection where there is life or there is death. What I love about this, though, is, is that the life of Christ is life, and he is on the hill of Calvary. I think, I think we know who wins already, right? Of course we do. But think about that for a moment. Wherever Jesus is, there is life. We already know the story, but we're going to look at what happened to him in Luke 23, and we're going to be in verse 26, the crucifixion. They had beaten Jesus. They had flogged him. He was, he was whipped 39 times. He was unrecognizable, most likely. His flesh torn apart. He was, he was beaten terribly, and now he has to carry his cross to the place of his crucifixion, and that's where we find ourselves Verse 26, as they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now, just so you know, if this is your first day here, I like to teach the Bible as we read through. So I'm going to stop and pause and teach as we go through. And what we see here is a man named Simon, which historians have tracked that he was from North Africa. He had traveled 800 miles from Africa to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And he had no idea that on this day, he would come in contact with the risen Lord now, or Jesus Christ, the Messiah. No idea. And they force him, the Roman soldiers force him to carry the cross. Now, what's interesting about this is there might be some deeper meaning because people who were guilty of their crimes carried their cross to the place of crucifixion. But suddenly, Jesus does not finish carrying his cross. Instead, Simon does for him. Could it be that this was a sign that Jesus was not guilty? He was not guilty, after all, of any sin, right? We know that. He was sinless and perfect. He didn't carry the cross to the place of crucifixion. Instead, mankind did. Simon did because he, Simon, or mankind representing us, humanity, are sinners. But Jesus is not. We are guilty of our sin. Jesus is not guilty of any sin. Now, what's interesting is Mark references and talks about Simon's children, Alexander and Rufus. So it is believed that Simon's family came to be believers and part of the family of God because of this day. Who would have known, Simon didn't, that on this day, to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem, 800 miles away from home, approximately, that he would come in contact and have an intersection with life and death and encounter instead the living Messiah, Jesus Christ being saved, and his whole family coming to believe in Jesus as well. Praise the Lord. Let's keep going, though. This is a very interesting portion of Scripture. Verse 27, Jesus has uh, enough energy to say something very important about the, the women and the people of Jerusalem. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Wow, that's deep. 
carrying, well, not anymore carrying a cross, but carrying this burden to the cross. He's barely alive, and he is, what do you, you know what he's doing here? He's actually caring for someone else. He's caring for an entire city, Jerusalem. He is suffering, and on his way to the crucifixion, he wants them to mourn for themselves and not even for him. Don't pity me. Pity yourself because you're lost. And if you think that if, if I'm going to be perfect and I'm, I'm fruitful and right now Jerusalem is good, just wait until I'm not here. See, right now the tree is green, but when it is dry, the Rome will burn you. Rome will destroy, destroy you. Do you know what he was talking about here? He was talking about in A.D. 70 when Nero and Rome began to destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple. It was so severe that there was violence and starvation within the people of, of the Israelites as well as Rome killing. There was so much murder and there was so much starvation that it would have been better for them not to have kids is what he's saying. Well, guess what? Years later, this happened in AD 70. And Jesus was saying, be concerned for your own self. Weep and turn back to me, in other words. To mourn and to weep is to repent and come back to God because it's going to get worse when I leave. You know how, you know how much love that is to, to take the time dying to say that? It doesn't sound like it, but he's warning them that this is coming. Now we go to verse 32. It says, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. That's it. That is literally how the crucifixion, crucifixion is explained. That's literally it. In all the gospels, it says that he's nailed to the cross or he's crucified. Why is it so simple and there's no dramatics around it and more explanation of the nails going through his hands? The only thing we know is, is that it was a fact that it happened and they didn't really want to dwell on that. They just said it happened. Simple as that. And the criminals were also crucified on his right and on his left. Now the word criminal here in the Greek, in Matthew's version of this, refers to someone who robs with violence. So it is believed that these two men had been thieves and were robbing homes and they had killed someone in the process. They belonged in, in this place. They were criminals sentenced to death by Rome. They were to die. And they're taken to the skull, which in Latin or in Greek is Calvary, which is interesting because the name of our church is Calvary. And no, we don't have a skull on the front of our church. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus has the power to redeem places that are meant for evil and death and turn it into a place of life, a place of life and everlasting joy. The hill of Calvary became a symbol of salvation and has changed the world since that day. Now he's in between two criminals. And when I read that this week, I just, I just really appreciated that because that means that Jesus was willing to get in the middle of our world to save us. On the right and on his left are two sinners, two criminals, and Jesus wasn't afraid to associate with the suffering and the crucifixion so that we could be delivered from it. God comes down in the flesh, in the middle of our world, in the middle of our darkness, in the middle of our tough circumstances, and he brings life. And then verse 34, no other gospel says this, just Luke. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes <clears throat> by throwing dice. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is actually fulfilling prophecy here from Isaiah 53, 12, where it says, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was interceding for sinners. He was interceding for those who were criminals. He did that for us. 
And by the way, Isaiah 53 is a beautiful picture explaining what Christ did for us. And yet it was written 800 years before Jesus actually went to the cross. Just more evidence of God's plan for us. Now, those responsible for the crucifixion were the priest and, and those who had planned his execution. And one commentator says this, those responsible for the crucifixion know what they are doing to Jesus, but they do not know what God is doing through Jesus. They don't know what you're doing, God. They don't know how you're using this to save them, God. That's what he's praying, including praying for their forgiveness. The redemptive and self-sacrificing love of the Father is demonstrated on the cross. He is surpassing their evil and enveloping them in prayer. What's amazing about this moment is Jesus represents the Lamb of God, the greatest sacrifice on the cross, and this sacrifice speaks forgiveness for all mankind. Now, I find that very interesting because animals were sacrificed for sins, but they never really truly worked. They had to do them every year at the, at the, the Passover. Every year they had to do these. Every day they had to sacrifice animals too. It never fully worked. Jesus is on the cross. And by the way, you, we know animals don't speak, right? <laughs> we watch a lot of cartoon movies. Got to make sure we remind ourselves. They don't. I watch a lot of kids movies with my kids. They don't speak. The supreme lamb of God, the supreme sufficient sacrifice is on the cross dying for our sins and at the same time speaking forgiveness for our sins. Just dwell on that for a moment. And he's being killed during this process. You will never find a love like that. You will never find a mercy like that except for Jesus Christ. And what's their response? what we would thought would be. Verse 35, the crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him by offering him a drink of wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fasted above him. And with these words, with these words, this is the king of the Jews. Now, one of the criminals hanging beside him also scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Well, I think about this scripture when I read that. I think about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles or the Romans that day. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, the cross or Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Praise the Lord. See, to them it was foolish the leader, the king of the Jews dying, the Romans wouldn't accept that. The Jews demanded signs and he had given them to him. They still didn't believe. So they mocked Jesus as if he wasn't the son of God, including the criminal next to him. But, but on the cross, something beautiful happens, an exchange. Verse 40, but the other criminal protested or rebuked his fellow criminal. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, or I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Real quick, just, just picture this. Jesus is on the cross dying and he's taking the time to save someone. He's using his strength to save someone. The, the faith of this criminal is, is rather beautiful and astounding. He's watched his fellow criminal and everyone around him uh, mock Jesus. 
but he doesn't follow the crowd. He's, he's different. He must, he must know something about Jesus enough to look to him and say these things. And as he rebukes his fellow criminal, he actually is confessing that he is guilty of sin and that Jesus is innocent. That's exactly what we do when we give our life to Christ, when we put our faith in him and get saved. He's confessing that. Jesus accepts his confession and says, you will be with me in paradise. Now that ruins everyone's theology on what you're supposed to do to get saved. And there was no water baptism next. They didn't take him off the cross real quick, dip him in water, bring him back, put him back up. That didn't take place. It literally was just faith in Jesus Christ. Now, just in case you haven't picked up on how much faith this is, he's believing in someone who's dying. How in the world is he supposed to save him? Right here in this moment, in the middle of life and death, we see a picture of the resurrection and the resurrected Lord. You see, this criminal had believed that Jesus would rise again right there on the cross because he wanted to be with him in paradise. He would be alive even if he were to die. And he believed that he could save him. Let me tell you what some commentators say. The faith of the repentant criminal is incredible. He just listens to everyone, chooses to defend him, and, and this is what happens here. Uh, some saw Jesus raise the dead and did not believe. The robber sees him being put to death and yet believes. For the unrepentant criminal, the one who was mocking Jesus, Jesus must come down from the cross to save him. For the repentant criminal, Jesus must remain on the cross and fulfill his divine duty to save. The petition of the repentant criminal is a witness of Jesus' death. Uh, Jesus' death is not a defeat, but a means of salvation. This man believed, and Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. That's all it takes is faith in Christ today. Praise the Lord. From that, there would be works in our lives if we're still alive. He would not get to experience that, but we do. Well, it was time for Jesus to die. Verse 44 says, by this time it was about noon and darkness fell over, uh, fell across the whole land until about three o'clock. So around noontime, the atmosphere out there changed. It was cloudy, it was stormy. There was darkness, the sun was hidden. And it was some kind of shaking because the temple curtain, that the one curtain that blocks everyone from the Holy of Holies, that only the priest, the high priest goes in once a year, was torn from the top down. And then Jesus shouts this, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. In John, it says that it is finished. I've completed my work. See, Jesus is the Lamb of God the perfect sacrifice on the cross. And what happened was that day, his sacrifice, his blood was so powerful that there was no longer any need to sacrifice animals anymore. And no longer did a priest have to come between them and God to be our mediator and to speak for us and pray for us. Instead, the the curtain was torn because the work was finished And now we can directly go to the Father in prayer because Jesus is before the Father, as we learned last week. He is before the Father pleading and praying for us. Praise the Lord. And for Christians that day, sacrifice is ended. It was done because Jesus was the great sacrifice, the sufficient one. And what's interesting is Jesus prays this prayer, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. This is actually a children's prayer that the Jews use, and it's quoted from Psalm 31, 5. And it's a bedtime prayer before they would go to bed. It was a custom that the Jewish children would pray these, this psalm. And it tells us how the Lord died because he entrusted his spirit 
He actually died with confidence. He actually died with peace. And he said, Lord, my spirit is in your hands. Today, you can do the same thing. You can, you can pray before you go to bed at night and know that your spirit, your life, your soul is in God's hands, that you are in good hands. And you can live with peace in this world that, that is shaking, in this world that is full of despair. You can live in peace because God has everything under control for you. On the cross, as he's dying, he demonstrates peace and confidence in his Lord. Verse 47, when the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent or righteous or other versions or other um, gospel books say the son of God. Surely this is the son of God. When all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. I love this. I love how this centurion, watching all of these things and even being part of the process of crucifying Jesus, sees all that happens, and now he turns and believes in Jesus Christ. It's never too late. Could it be, by the way, though, that this is the first convert after Christ died on the cross. And it happens to be a Gentile, not a Jew. And this is what scripture says, John 12, 32. And I, this is Jesus talking, when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, that's what he's talking about, will draw all people to myself. All people can be saved. Anyone is welcome into the kingdom of God if you believe. Anyone. <laughs> Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed, this is Paul, of the gospel, the good news, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Here we have at this intersection of life and death, a person who's in charge of bringing death onto someone's life, now putting his faith in eternal life. It's a great paradox, isn't it? That here, the instrument that's, that's known for death, the cross, it's known for execution. God uses it to execute salvation. Jesus flips everything around. God uses what the devil meant for harm to bring us good. Come on, praise the Lord. Was this the end? Was the road to the cross a dead end? Perhaps that's what his closest followers were thinking. Maybe they forgot his words. If you destroy this temple... I'll rebuild it in three days. If you destroy the temple, it will be rebuilt in three days. Maybe they didn't remember that. Maybe they didn't really understand what he meant there. But what about what he said in, in John 16, 20? I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me. But the, Lord, uh, the world will rejoice. See, the world was happy. Those, his enemies were happy that he died. And they were mourning. And then he says this, you will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. You have sorrowed now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. These are the words he said to them before he went to the crucifixion in John chapter 16. Could it be though that in their grief, these words were forgotten? It appears so. Because they buried him and he went into a tomb. And now we pick up to that glorious morning in Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to read it for you. And I want you to think about this for a moment. That, you know, it's, it's the Sabbath. You can't do anything. For these people, for the Jews at this, at this time, 
They rested. They did no work. They had nothing to preoccupy their mind. All they did was sit around and eat together and talk together. And I'm sure that there was a lot of suffering and sorrow. A lot of questions being asked. Why did this happen? What happened? And then it was time. It was Sunday morning. The Sabbath was over. And the women were going to the tomb to actually, hopefully, have the tomb open and anoint Jesus' body. Just so you know, for evidence sake, a lot of scholars say they shouldn't have gone to the tomb, right? They should have, they should have just known he was already alive. But be, see, here's the thing. Even his closest followers doubted at times. Even his closest followers didn't understand And so it actually becomes evidence that something changed because that day, they changed forever. There was something different about his closest followers. Here's what happens. Matthew 28, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Why do you look for the living or for the dead? um, Why do you look for the living among the dead? As another gospel says, church, you cannot kill life. You cannot end life. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Death could not hold him. Up from the grave, he rose again. Praise the Lord. Now, that wasn't enough. The angel says, Come and see where his body was lying. Now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. This is the great Easter mandate. Come and see. Come and experience the living Christ and then go tell everyone he is alive. That is our mandate. That's what God told us to do. Praise the Lord. Verse 8 says, the woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened, but also filled with great joy. There it is. Your sorrow and grief will turn to joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus himself met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and did what we all do now. We worship him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. For quite a few days, Jesus begins to appear to his disciples, to Thomas, the doubter, to 500 witnesses at one time. And from that point forward, the church exploded. The evidence of a risen Lord is so great. There are so many huge books that would put you to sleep trying to read about it. It is amazing. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll be really excited about it. It's incredible of the evidence we have that Jesus is alive. The church would never be the same again. The church was born because Jesus is alive. What does this all mean? Why does the crucifixion and the resurrection mean so much to us? It's so simple. I I can't I can't make it clever and catchy. I'm just going to tell you. Jesus died so we can be forgiven. Jesus rose again so we could have new life even now and then life after death or eternal life. What do I mean by new life? Well, you can be a different person now and then if we were to die, we would have eternal life. He changes your heart. He changes your mind. He makes you a new creation. And we have the promise that if we were to die, he would raise us up again to everlasting life. And if he comes back before we die, we have everlasting life because he is the resurrection and the life. The crucifixion is a sufficient payment for all our sin. The resurrection is proof that it worked. You see, when he died, 
It could have been the end, but he rose again to prove that his payment was enough. God accepted Jesus' sacrifice for us and rose him back to life. That was his approval of what Jesus did for us. The cross was an instrument for death. The tomb was a place for the dead, but the power of Christ's blood overcame them both. What was meant for death, God used it to save and bring us life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.